Okay, first off, uh, we want to welcome Efren Reyes to the uh, AccuStats Arena, and we want to thank you for all that you've meant to the fans, the sport, and personally for myself. So uh, glad to have you here, and it's very gracious of you. Yeah, please welcome him. Today we're going to do something just a little bit different. We're going to have a little fun. We're just going to chat. And this is not going to be about the basic Efren history that you may or may not already know, or you could research and find out. But it's about some special times that we shared along the way. And just so everybody knows, uh, I've known Efren quite a while. He's never lied to me, nor exaggerated. And I felt like uh, sometimes I wish he would have. And when I first met him, he said uh, that I should come to the Philippines good training for me. And at the time, I was on the men's pro tour, and I was probably about like number 21, and I really wanted to be top 10. And I could see that what he said was true. And I said, well, if I come to the Philippines, could I win a little money maybe to help cut down the expenses? And he looked at me, <laughs> and he rubbed his chin, and he said, you're not ready. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I went there, and it was, that is the truth, boy. <laughs> and I didn't know, but anyway. So uh, glad to have you here, Efren. Uh, thank you very much. So I invite, every time they invite me here in a Derby Classic. OK. So today, we're going to start off with a few questions. They won't be hard questions. When you were young and learning to play, did you lose often? Oh, no, no. When, when I was young, I then keep practicing to, my, to myself to make improving. Uh, how can I improve? Uh, always thinking about every, every shot. And even at night, after the matches were over with, you would practice the shots, right? Yeah, even at night. Even when I sleep, they, uh, my dream, uh, dreaming, and uh, they help me to play pool. And so it's, it's not just natural ability with you. It's all the focus and the intention. And naturally, you have natural ability. But you've worked very hard over the years. Yeah, you have to concentrate uh, to play pool. You have to, every time, you have to learn every, everything, the kind of shot. And you, you never seem emotional about the pool game. Like, you never get angry or anything. You just concentrate, even when you make a mistake or an error. You respect the sport so much that uh, you concentrate on it and then maybe come back. And I, I oftentimes see you work on shots after the fact. It may be because I, when, when I'm shooting, if, if I miss uh, the kind of shot, I was thinking about that. Uh, maybe next time, n never do it because I, I play wrong this time. Yeah. OK. And uh, every day that we're together in the Philippines, uh, we would go to the various pool rooms. And there's always matches, not just for me, but for you as well. And I think that really contributed to the fact that you're always in competition there. Oh, well, a lot of people, they, they like to play me at the port. But the people, I, they give me, they, I give them uh, a lot of uh, spot for a uh, pro player. When I was there, you would play rotation. And maybe you would give a 75-45 handicap to guys that were A-class players, I mean, professional players. And at the time, in the Philippines, what you might not know, there's always action. In every city block of Manila, there's at least one pool room, maybe three or four, two or four tables. And when you go in there, it doesn't matter if you're me or him or, or just a beginner. There's a game for you, and there's matchmakers, and there's a lot of interest in it. And it's very exciting. And every day that I was there, he would give a killer player 75-45 rotation. And I'm thinking, there's no way. That, I mean, and so I kind of want to bet against you because I could win. But I hate to win that way, so I just throw up a token $20 bill on Efren just as a, I'm going to lose, but whatever. And uh, throughout the month, he never lost. And I could have paid for my whole trip. <laughs> I was a coward, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but he would win every day. And he loved, it wasn't about the money. And he's a very gracious kind of a guy that oftentimes he'd win a, a couple hundred dollars. And before we left the pool room, he's given most of it away to people that really need it, surreptitiously. And uh, 
we, we just had that challenge. It was He knows he's going to play the next day, the next day, the next day. So he's not worried about it. And so this is why he's a beloved character in the Philippines. Everybody knows that, that Efren Reyes, is he's the top, top. That's Michael Jordan of the Philippines. Um, when, when you first came here, uh, people know the Cesar Morales story already. But talk a little bit about your experience at Reds in Houston. When I come out in the United States, 1985, I, the first time I came in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, the, the Red Nine Bull Tournament. But uh, I don't thinking about to play in the tournament. I was come here to play a, a lot of people uh, uh, to to like a money game like that. I'm looking for a uh, action always there. I want to play everybody here. But uh, I I don't thinking about how I play the good player here. I thinking about the low first before I play the the good player. But uh, when I come here, they got a, a tournament here. So my my stakeholders, my sponsor, they want me to play a, a tournament, so, so it's better. And uh, when you played, this is the story. I was not there, but you lost a match to Buddy Hall only. I I play everybody, I almost every every night. But uh, when I play uh, Buddy Hall uh, at the last, you know, because I'm too tired already to play, and and then. Uh, this, that's the first time I played Temple. I see. Well, do you think that maybe at that time that, uh, you know, naturally we regard Buddy Hall and Mike Siegel as our top two players? Oh, yeah, they're very good. I was in the, in the video with the Oil Britannia, Mike Siegel and Nick Barner and uh, uh, with the other, no. Yeah, no, not me, Sirach. She passed away already. Uh, I forgot his name. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, it's been a while back for both of us. Uh, before that, uh, when I first heard the legend of Efren Reyes, it was one of these things where uh, I'd been told and I'd only seen that Americans invented the game, Americans perfected the game, no one could beat us at it. And so I'm not necessarily predisposed to go that way, but that's all I ever knew. Then he came here, and he could beat everybody. And the other top players were a little bit jealous and not open-minded, and they just soon he went back where he came from and never come back here again. Okay, But I was always I would love to see, because I'd never seen some of the shots played that way. And so uh, it pioneered you know, the, the evolution of kick safety and the, the thought regarding that. We were just straight shooters that broke well. And then he came and added that tactical side to the game, a, a little different dimension that you, know, you hadn't previously witnessed before. So it definitely revolutionized the sport. Uh, when I came here, uh, you know, I saw a lot of good uh, players, but uh, I see every time they practice, they rock the ball. Oh, they make me scared because they always run out. But when I saw it, uh, the ball is difficult, they don't know what to do. So I think I can beat them. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you remember when we first met? Yeah, in 1986. <laughs> okay. He came to Moline, and I was practicing, and I heard of him, and I desperately wanted to meet him. And they said, uh, hey, uh, the guy that normally does this, uh, Efren needs a tip on his cue, and we're afraid to do it. Would you do it? And they know I'm very meticulous. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. So he gave me an Elk Master tip that he wanted on his cue. And I'm thinking, I'm very meticulous on my own. I'm extra careful on his. So I, <laughs> this is so funny. I go, I go back, and I put it on, and I take my time, and I craft it. And his shaft is it's real gummy and sticky, and it's got a few dings in it. And so... I'm, uh, I think I'll really polish this up and make it brand new. He's going to love this. And I crowned the tip just perfect and got it out there. And I came out and I said, here it is. And he looked at it and uh, he was a little puzzled. And I was hoping for maybe some appreciation. You know, and he says to Rolando, he says, uh, Mark, uh, Efren wants the file that you shaped the tip with. And I said, okay. Well, he starts sawing it flat. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, okay, whatever. And then he felt it and he could feel that it was really slick and he didn't like it. No, because it erased all the magic from it. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I make uh, all the magic when, when I play with uh, Eric Masterford. 
I felt terrible about it after it was such a careful job. But that was that was our first meeting, and he forgave me, and and the magic did return. And you know, uh, sometimes in the middle of a match, okay, sometimes you'll be playing, and you might switch the entire cue. You you know, even no matter what, is that is there a purpose or a reason? Be, because some, sometimes when when I shoot. Sometimes the ball is very heavy or be, very light. That's why I change the the key stick for uh, how 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 to how to use it. Because sometimes you know my key stick, uh, it cannot draw very good. The other one, it can it draw very good. Yeah. When uh, you know naturally, your favorite game is 15 ball rotation. Yeah, that's my first time I play uh, rotation. I always, every time I practice, always rotation, not nothing else. And then when you play nine ball, it's a much simpler path to run out because you don't have the clutter. Yeah, because uh, if you play nine ball for practice, there's no concentrate for that. Uh, in playing rotation, even in your practice, you concentrate to play how to run out, how to how play the cue ball to position to everything. There's way more skill. When I was young, I was always told that straight pool is the game of choice, that if you master straight pool, you master everything. But then after many years, I, I think rotation truly is the best game because it's much more complete. In one game of rotation, you'll have three or four combinations, caroms, kiss shots, and you're chronically playing the cue ball off of other balls. And so you learn skills. A lot of people want to know you know, uh, how you see some of those shots, and I think it comes from the rotation play. Rotation, you can learn everything because, uh, you, you know, the rotation is very, very hard. You, you may hook, so you, you can learn about uh, even the kick shot. Yeah. And everybody's always interested because you kick with special speeds and angles, and they want to know, how would you learn that, or do you just feel that, or how, it, what, how was that developed? I feel that because uh, when I kick, uh, if you kick the if you kick the ball, you have to know how to speed, you, how to hit the ball, and uh, how what kind of speed for that. Okay, um, one pocket. Let's talk about one pocket because you're you're an absolute master at one pocket, as evidenced by your picture being upstairs here six times, out of maybe twelve or thirteen times that you even played in the tournament. Um, could you talk about when Freddie Benavagna in Chicago taught you how to play one pocket? Do you remember this? Who is, who is that? You know, Bank and Freddie. Freddie Benavagna. Oh, Freddie is the one who taught me how to play pool. Uh, you know, every time I come to billiard Chicago, we always playing about uh, one pocket. If if I play wrong, something, something, and then he, he, uh, he showed me the way how to shot, how to move, and and uh, how to how to put the ball. Very good. Okay, Efren is being very gracious. I'm going to tell you the actual story. We were there, and uh, Freddie says, uh, you know, Efren, I can't play you nine ball, but I can play you one pocket. But to be fair, you don't know one pocket. So I'm going to teach you one pocket. It's $50 a game, and I'm going to spot you a ball because you've never played before. So the, the, the match starts day one. Efren gets eight to seven and wins. They come back the next day, and clearly Efren's too good. So Freddie says, all right, well, I'll teach you one pocket. It's $50 a game. We'll play even. Efren wins. Day three, we come back. <laughs> Efren gives him 8-7. Efren wins. So <laughs> you're a very good student, as it turns out. Oh, yeah, because, uh, you know, it's very easy only because uh, if you play good, you know, if you got a shot, you, all, you always run out. You, you might improve too much because you can see to, to is playing a very good uh, moving. And I learned from that pretty and uh, Billing Cardone. Billy and Cardona. Now, he said Efren is the only guy that plays better than he matches up. And he said every time he played him, he thought he had the best of it, and Efren always won. Um, you know, just to, going back to about the Billiard Cafe time, do you, do you remember playing a big match with Bugs? Yeah, I remember that uh, when I stake me with uh, Arch the Archibald. Yeah. yeah, then I play uh, Bugs for always uh, race to for. I think I play him like about uh, four set, like like something. It, you you played him a race to four for seventy five hundred, and uh, I hadn't I had never really seen you play one pocket at that point. So I'm I don't know. And Bugs he can invent banks, and you remember right how well he banks, amazing. 
And so uh, Bugs beats Efren in the first set, 4-0. And I'm thinking, boy, this is going to be tough. I, I don't know. And then the next set, he starts off 2-0 in front of you. And after that, Efren just uh, won that game and then won another set. And then the game was over for a little bit, and then you played one set for 15,000, and it was like a race to seven, and you pretty much dominated. Yeah, and, um, I think I never uh, play a race to seven, always a race to four only. But uh, in, in one set, maybe the third time or four times, he uh, beat me like, like that. And then after that, one more set, four double, yeah. then uh, he lost. But I always uh, win like uh, every time I beat him, like for zero, for, for two, like that. Yeah, you, we've had a lot of good matches over the years. If, uh, if, if you were to give like Americans some advice on how they should go about getting better, and everybody's interested and everybody wants to know what you think about it. So what, would you, what kind of advice would you give to uh, American players? Well, I, I see a lot of American players, they're very good, they're very strong, you know. <laughs> when I advise them, because it's very, it's very good break, very good pocketing. Only maybe every time uh, they practice, only con concentrate only. Okay, so we're going to change topics here for just a moment. I'm in the Philippines with you, and... We'd play in the afternoon, you and I, and he, he would literally run racks of rotation. And now I'd seen a couple occasional racks of rotation, but I hadn't truly played a whole lot of rotation in the past. And he was running, you know, almost like maybe I could if on a good day of nine ball. And I said, uh, in the middle of all that, you would break and run three consecutive racks of rotation. And the first day it happened, I thought maybe just the, the stars line up and you got the best player in the world, something like this could happen. And then day two comes, he breaks and runs three racks in the middle of our practice session. And then day three comes, same thing. And so I said, well, I can't believe this, Efren. What is the most racks of rotation that you've ever run? Uh, only, I think uh, only four times only because, you know, why? it's not a uh, winner's break in the Philippines when you play a rotation or split the coins. So you have to flip for every break. So when I said, how was the most racks of this you've ever run? He says, he thinks to me, he goes, only four. And I go, oh, only four. You just didn't make a ball in a break or you didn't get a shot. He says, no, you know, yeah, only win four coin flips. <laughs> and it is absolutely true. Um, another time, and I want to go back to this point. I met you in 86. And... We were talking, uh, moving forward, and we were talking about when you played your very best pool, which is before I ever met you, you said, all right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I used to be very, very good from 1973 to 76. And then uh, I, nobody played me, and then I stopped and started playing uh, Karum for six years, for about 76 to, I think, 81. And then from 81 no more, and then I stopped. So he says that even if I break safe in rotation, he can still run out. And what that means is if I put the cue ball down behind the rack and just let the one ball leak off, he's going to kick and hit it square enough that it's going to go towards the side pocket. When it scores in the side pocket, the cue ball is going to chip the rack. And if he gets a shot, he can even run out from a safe break when he was playing his best. But this was before I ever met him, which I, I couldn't believe that he ever played better, but uh, he's never exaggerated anything, so I accept. Then he said that he took time away from pool because no one would play him anymore and just played billiards and caroms and bock line, right? Yeah, I started playing uh, bock line. With, 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 I don't play uh, straight drill. Uh, because, uh, it's very easy for the other player. You've been an old player. They play good for, for that. But uh, when you play for... Uh, uh, backline and one question, maybe you can learn about the uh, move out to use the cue ball and then help you for uh, playing pool in the pocket. Tremendous help. And, and most of us pool players, we do not emphasize the billiard side of pocket billiards. We emphasize pocketing, breaking, that's gratifying. But the actual moving the balls on the table, like you might with 18-2 eight, buckline, is that what you play? No, 18-1. Uh, that 18-2 almost, uh, almost is straight trail. The backline, no, only one time, only in, inside. 
Okay. Um, so anyway, all those you played one cushion, two cushion, three cushion billiards, right? Yeah. And ball line. Okay, and so this is a, a dimension of the sport that none of us emphasize. One, it's, it's largely dead. It died with our grandpas, so that nobody around here plays it, so nobody understands it. And nor is it the glamorous, exciting, blast them, nine ball flies in, win the game, sip a beer, get five bucks. You know what I mean? It's not like that. It's far more tedious and structured, but that gives you the big edge. I think when you play one pocket, that's one of the reasons that, that you excel at that because you can maneuver the yeah, secondary ball. If you are shooting uh, good, you, know, you can learn about it because uh, you can see a lot of people playing uh, one pocket uh, that you can learn. Every time I'm watching and then uh, I, I, I try to play too when, when I'm practicing uh, by myself with playing rotation and then I put the ball and then I start to run. I, I, put, I put the other playing, the, the one you shoot, and then I'll, I'll try every time. He... One time when Efren had told me that he played better before I met him, and I, I couldn't conceive of that because he's the best I ever saw, we were, uh, you remember the pool room we went to when Marlon Manalo was the uh, snooker champion? Uh, I don't remember. It was a gymnasium. It was a government sponsor. A gymnasium. They call it the Rachel Memorial. Okay, and and he got a uh, he won. You played Marlon, and we'd been just traipsing around Manila and uh, and surrounding communities for a month. He hadn't seen a snooker table, and everybody wanted you to play Marlon. And Marlon exclusively played on those six by twelve tables, and he was mandated by the government to only play snooker. He couldn't play you pool. Yeah, uh, you know, when uh, we are there with training, because uh, when we're playing about uh, Southeast Asian game or Asian game, you have to play only uh, snooker, not, not pool, because there's nothing in a Southeast Asian game to play pool. So they put a uh, snooker in the Rachel Memorial, and then we start playing over there. And then Larno uh, is improving a lot, and then that's how they play good in uh, snooker. Anyway, <laughs> bottom line, Efren stepped up and beat him on the 6x12, and he hadn't seen the 6x12 the month I was there, and I don't think he emphasized 6x12 much anyway, but one time I was talking to Steve Davis, maybe the greatest snooker player of all time, and he assured me that if you would focus on snooker, you would be top, top in that, and be formidable. Oh, yeah, I saw them, and I, when I, every time they... they Video, I, I, I watch the play. Why is uh, snooker is, uh, you know, very, very, they, they always run out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about our experience in uh, Hong Kong, okay? And uh, we got to go there a number of times, and there was a man uh, that uh, set this up, and, and I first met him, I, I suppose, maybe even before you, when uh, I went over and he had, a, like, a, in his private club, a small tournament. And and Bob, his name is Bob Moore, and he really deserves mention, but nobody knows of him. Uh, he's passed away now, but he was a great man that was going to do a lot for the sport and just loved pool. But his income came from horse racing, and, and you could bet horse racing in Hong Kong because the handle is so large because everyone gambles. And he devised a computer system to beat horse racing in Hong Kong only. And out of this, he amassed millions and millions of dollars, and he loved pool, so he would be, you know, set up matches, and informal matches. And he called me, and he said, um, Mark, uh, uh, who's the best player in the world? And I said, Efren Reyes is. And uh, Bob and I got along good, and he kind of trusted me, and so he said, okay. Well, then he was talking to Earl Strickland. And Earl said, no, Bob, I'm the best nine ball player, you know. And, uh, and, and Bob said, no, no, Mark told me. And, and so there was a little bit of an argument. And Bob says, well, I'll tell you what. We'll just set up a match, and we'll start it next week. And we'll find out who the best is. And he put up $100,000 cash, right? Yeah. And he, got, he, he got a hold of you at that point, right? Yeah, well, the first time that they invite, invite our I uh, invite me, and then uh, he call uh, our sponsor, uh, Puy uh, Rescue Puts Puya, to play uh, early street club. But we don't know about that. We got a game, which is very annoying. Because I was in uh, Port Lauderdale, and there we are playing tournament. And then suddenly, uh, one week, we start playing. And then, uh, you know, Bob Moore, 
always as with, with us in, in uh, Hong Kong. They, they bring me everywhere, and then, then and sometimes if I, if I play Strickland, he, he helped me too, not Strickland. <laughs> <laughs> Bob was kind of a, a tempestuous, uh, uh, kind of a wild guy. Maybe he has a little bit of the spontaneity that you see from Earl Strickland, but he wanted to see this match, uh, and it was going to be a race to 100 games. Do you remember that? Yeah, 100. 100. Uh, uh, only you race to 35 for uh, one day, Saturday, every, every uh, other day. It was an absolute fantastic match, and you might be able to find it on YouTube. I know AccuStats sells it still, and it's, it's incredible. It's three days of play, and you will see everything you want, need to see about nine ball. If you want to learn how to play, th this match is still epic. And I so much wanted to go off because we'd never had a big match with $100,000 cash. And uh, Bob was that type of guy that he would be committed to do more of these. And so... He had it in his private club, and it was invitational only. It was a black tie affair. You couldn't buy your way in. It was a very small club, and only Bob would do this. He, he had a club in the Wan Chai district of Hong Kong, which would be like, you said you wanted to have a private club on Wall Street here in America. It's the absolute uh, epitome of the financial center of all of Asia, so it's enormous. And Bob just spends the money and just has this private club. And there's no way you couldn't sell enough of anything to even pay the rent there, let alone make a profit. But it was just his clubhouse, and it was private. And so he had you and Earl come. And then Earl wanted to play to 120, just so there's no luck. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, when we, I play uh, Strickland, he thinks he win, he win Earl. But uh, he, he play good. You know, every time he... he Every time he break, he make, he make a ball. I don't, I don't know, but my my break is no good in the beginning. But uh, you know, people from uh, from the bar in that place, they saw Strickland uh, at night. He was by himself practicing. He knocked, he knocked the ball in the in the spot so that he can make a ball in the break. Well, and then after that, uh, when when they told me like that. I know, too, so that it changed. So what happened, it changed. I make a ball, don't break a ball now. All, all he's thinking about, he's looking about everywhere. Um, day one, the final score was 35-32 Strickland. And I'm watching, and uh, watching intently, and I'm thinking, uh, man, 35-32, but really, Efren got the best of the roles. But 30, no. 35-32 in the beginning. Then then uh, 63, 70 in the second, and then eight, I think 84 to 100, 105, 105 to uh, I think 80 something. Okay, so day one, this is how I remember it, 35, 32, and I'm saying Efren got all the rolls and Strickland won, but Strickland's break was so good, he was running two and three racks quite often, and your break really wasn't working well. No, don't, uh, don't work, my break don't work, but in the last, uh, last match, uh, my break is working. So then day two goes 70, 63, and Strickland got all the rolls. So when you watch this match, you can go back and watch it, and you will see what I'm talking about. There's not another living human being that would have won, uh, got 63 games. He made outs from nowhere. Strickland would break, three balls go in, the one ball sift back, out two or three times in a row. And so this was just the way he was playing. And there wasn't anything that you were doing wrong. You were not getting any shots from the break, or maybe you were not even making a ball in the break, and he was frequently running many racks. And at the end of day two, no one would be within seven games of Earl Strickland. Day three started off, and Strickland opened up with another three or four racks and played real steady, and uh, you were battling. And at one point, we had an intermission. And I'll never forget this. The score was 104 for Strickland. 104, 87, yeah, like that. Yes. And so uh, Strickland needs to win 16 games, and you have to win 33. And I went back and replayed it, and during that, you broke and ran out 19 times. During that, not in a row, but in that span when you came back to win. 
And one of the games you broke and played such a good safety, he was forced to give you ball in hand. So 20 games, Strickland didn't even get a shot in. And then it kind of battled back and forth. It was 117 apiece. When you were down 104-87, and it had really been three days of tough play, what was going on in your head? No, I don't, I don't think I can win anymore because in the first time, uh, in the beginning, people told me if I can beat them in the 35 to 30. I, I think it's still okay because uh, there is uh, still a long, long game. Then after that, uh, 70, 63, what do you think now? They said, how uh, can you win? I think it's still okay because uh, it's, it's only uh, 70, we are playing 150. So after that, uh, in, the, in the middle, of, in the last day, middle of the game, uh, the score is 104 to 104 to 87. Well, what do you think, I don't know. Maybe no chance. <laughs> and uh, everybody, I be my sponsor. They going back to hotel. And they sleep. They think I lose already. When up, then uh, they find out I, I I win the game. Oh, it was amazing, and uh, it was. Uh, I feel honored and blessed, uh, not just to sit here with you today, but to have been present for that ma epic match. And Bob Moore was this guy. Uh, one time, I went back to the hotel room, and he had paid for this coverage to be on E, uh, not the uh, CNN. Yeah, headline news around. And once an hour, they would say live from. Ridgeways in Hong Kong last night, the match went down like this. And I was just laying on my bed, and I'm like, you can't, you got to be kidding me. But that's just how big, a, Bob was bigger than life, wasn't he? All the things he do was always big. <laughs> yeah, always, always like that. He'd been uh, in, in uh, his room, he always watching uh, TV, but uh, sometimes uh, watching, but to see only the horse racing. <laughs> yeah, Bob was very serious about horse racing, and uh one time in particular, I guess there had been an issue that uh, Strickland's behavior wasn't quite right, and Bob couldn't show up to the pool match until later in the day, and he texted or faxed into my room that we're not going to have any more behavior like that, and I want you to issue both players a warning. I won't be there. And so uh, I called Earl, and he was, he was not really engaged, and, and he was uh, troubled, and I said, uh, Earl, just come down to my room and you have a chance and I, I need to talk to you. Now, if you want to say anything to me, you can just tell me on the phone. And uh, I, I know how he is, and he has a first-class airplane ticket, and he says, uh, I said, well, just when you get a minute, I'm going to be here all day, so uh, just any time. No, I'm not coming down there. And uh, I know you're for effort anyway. And I said, no, that's not the way it is. I, whoever plays the best, I just want the match to go down. But I really need to talk to you. So I ended up that I explained to him that uh, Bob was upset with some of his behavior last night and said he wouldn't tolerate it. And if he, if he forfeited you, that he was not going to pay anything more than these expenses. And I wanted the match to go down because Bob would consistently do more matches. So anyway, Earl agreed that he would no longer criticize the referee or the score people or anything else that was agitating him. He would come to me, and I was doing the broadcast. And so uh, then I called Efren, and, I, and I've always felt bad about this, just so you know. And because Efren had truly not did anything wrong, but Bob instructed me to have both of them sign off on what constitutes a forfeit. So I called Efren. And he's, why are you talking to me? Talk to him. I, I didn't do anything. I go, I know, I know, but it's just what Bob told me to do. So Earl didn't sign the paper. So anyway, Bob assumes that this has happened. So I'm in the broadcast booth doing the commentary, and Earl started off, his mind was better, and he, he was behaving good, and Bob wasn't there. And then midway through the day, Bob arrived, and I'm in the broadcast booth, and Earl started misbehaving. And, I, and Bob thinks that I've issued this warning. And I'm like, oh, oh please don't. No, not Earl. <laughs> well, don't do this, Earl. You know, and, and the whole time, I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> you remember this? Yeah, I remember the, the thing. Uh, you know, we've been strictly, if you talk to me, don't want to talk to you. <laughs> You're right. Right, right. So anyway, uh, we got through that, and then and the match did go down, which is really what ultimately happened. And and then the the thrill of victory. That would you think that that maybe is one of your most thrilling victories that you ever had? Oh yeah, because uh, when I play, uh, you know, Strickland, and then I don't think I can win for that. But uh, that time we are both playing good in in uh, the game of the 
uh, the game of the nine ball uh, to play in, in our mid, mid which we with a uh, bar table with uh, Bob Moore. Yeah. And, he, and he got a good table over there. You know, I don't think it's a, very, uh, a, big, a big and very good cloth too. Yeah, yeah, and so it was just a, it was a wonderful experience we got to share, and it was something that will live on in history. Uh, one, the match, and two, the comeback. That it was I've never seen another great player come back from 17 games back, and uh, you ended up winning uh, 33 games and Strickland won 13. Oh no, no, because if you you break, it's making good. So you, I think you still you you can win because you know sometimes you play a very good player and they break good. You race to let them, you might don't shoot. Who is the best American player, the toughest competitor that you've ever played, and then around the world, who's the best that you think? When I came here, at the, at the, when I came here the first time in the United States, I think the best uh, player here I can see is uh, Mike Seeger. It's my toughest uh, opponent in the world. How about, uh, oh, in the world, okay. Yeah, because yeah. I, saw, I saw his game, uh, he know everything too. Uh, he shoot very good, you know how to uh, pre-position for other, uh, uh, for shooting the next, uh, next ball, yeah. Would you describe playing Ronnie O'Sullivan in snooker? Uh, when in uh, 1990, I think 1991 or 92, they, they invite us to play snooker in uh, Thailand. You know, everybody, they play elimination for, for playing snooker. And uh, Ronnie Silvan plays always century. Every time he, he play, always century. And he got a award for uh, uh, watch. And they give him what's to uh, award, and then he, for me, they give me to uh, like the same for him because uh, we we finish about the century in uh, five minutes, and then after that, uh, after that they break. Uh, we're going to action game, so people pro from other country they play money game for for that, and then they try to. Play me with with the snooker, snu and then first uh, I play uh, the, the Hong Kong player. I, I I I told them I cannot beat you because you play good. I saw you play good. You always resent your return. You, you gotta give me spot. <laughs> I was then I tried to make a try to give me spot for 20 points. He said no, it's only five points. I said, no, it's, no, only five points, no good. <laughs> I said, okay, 15, I said, give me 15. No, only five points. And then we start playing for five points, and then I play. And then, uh, and then I start playing, and then I beat like, like about four, four, frame, uh, four games. And then Ronnie Silvan is coming, he said, yeah, I, I want to play next. For, for, and then after that, okay. How are we gonna play? Uh, okay, I give you t 10 points, he said. No, give me 30 points. <laughs> I see you always a uh, century. Every time they, I saw you, century. So it's, uh, 30 is very hard. Give, oh no, maybe uh, 20, okay? Um, okay, give me 20. And then you start playing for uh, 1,000. Uh, a game, and he lost. And he starting to uh, get mad, you know. Hey, April, I, I want to play you even in your game, nine ball. How can we play nine ball if there is no uh, pull nine, uh, for a nine by nine here? All, all everything is snooker. Do we play nine ball here in snooker? This is snooker. <laughs> this is your table. It's all good. You got to give me weight, it's fat. <laughs> Okay, oh, what kind of spot you want? You give me four seven, four seven, the the brown and the black, the seven. Okay, but only for five hundred. Okay, you flip, flip. I win the flip. I break, I break a uh, safety. <laughs> the, he, he can win it, so he he, he get mad. <laughs>
uh, we're, we're going to have to wrap this up. And I'm sorry for that. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. And this is the greatest nine ball player that ever lived. Greatest pool player. Thank you much, Efren. Love you, brother. Thank you.